Metal framing is a method of constructing using heavy and light gauge steel. Today, light gauge steel is specified for residential, light commercial, and heavy commercial structures. Few advantages over conventional wood framing are the fact that light gauge steel is perfectly straight. It is not affected by decay. It has a better fire resistance and does not deform like similar wood framing members. For traditional construction, each wood framing member can be replaced with metal framing members. Light gauge steel framing members are fabricated from structural quality sheet steel by cold forming. Light gauge steel framing members may have a dimple texture applied during manufacturing that provide additional strength, grab screws better, and holds the screws tighter so wall sheathing does not pull away. Light gauge steel metal framing members receive a protective coating to prevent corrosion during transportation, storage, and final placement. The protective coating is applied using a hot dipped steel galvanized treatment. Light gauge steel framing members are available in various shapes, thicknesses, and strengths. Common light gauge steel framing member shapes include C shape and track. The C-shape is the most common produced for light gauge steel framing and it is used for studs and joists. C-shape consists of a web, flange, and lip. Web depths range from 1 and 5 eighths of an inch to 12 inches. The flanges stiffen the web and provide services for attaching sheathing and gypsum board. The lips extend from the flanges on the open side and stiffen the flanges. The track is used for top and bottom plates. The term gauge traditionally has been the unit of measurement for identifying sheet steel thickness. The higher the gauge number, the thinner the steel. Proper fastening systems are crucial for establishing proper connections between steel framing members. Fastening methods include self-tapping screws, welds, and spot clinching. Pneumatically driven pins are commonly used to fasten subfloor and sheathing to steel joists and studs. Self-tapping screws are used to fasten metal framing members to each other and to fasten other materials to metal framing members. As the name implies, self-tapping screws cut their own threads and they are being driven into the metal framing members. Self-tapping screws include self-drilling and self-piercing screws. Self-drilling screws are the most common steel-to-steel -steel fasteners. Most screws used in light gauge framing have a galvanized finish. Self-drilling screws should be 3 eighths of an inch to a half an inch longer than the materials fastened together, and at least three threads will extend past the fastened material. Coarse threads are used for lighter materials, and finer threads are used when tapping into thicker steel material. For light gauge steel construction methods, the layout and components of steel frame building is pretty similar to wood framing, the only differences being the tools used and fastening methods. As a side note, when working with steel, using a magnetic measuring tape and level could make your job a little easier. A drywall screwdriver is used to fasten metal framing members together and to fasten panel sheathing or gypsum board to the metal framing members. The nose piece on drywall screwdrivers control the depth to which the screw is driven and prevents screws from going through the panel or gypsum board. When driving screws, start the screw spinning slowly to allow the point to cut through the metal. Most often, welding is used for prefabricated wall sections. When welding light gauge steel components, the zinc coating applied during the galvanization process will be destroyed in the welding area. A corrosion resistant coating must be applied to the area. The most common way to cut metal framing members is to use an abrasive cutoff saw or chop saw. Unlike miter saws, abrasive cutoff saw blades cannot be rotated from side to side for angled cuts. Rather, the saw fence is adjusted from the side for angled cuts. As the name implies, an abrasive cutoff saw is equipped with an abrasive blade. Proper protection is strongly recommended when using this kind of saw. There are certain handheld power tools that can cut metal framing members up to 16 gauges. 20 and 18 gauge framing members can be cut with aviation snips. The cut edge of the metal is very sharp, therefore it is recommended to use the angled aviation snips to protect your knuckles. A locking C-clamp is convenient for holding metal framing members tightly together while they are being fastened. Small bar clamps may also be used to hold members together. In the image we can see a framed floor unit over a basement foundation. 
Load-bearing C-shaped steel joists are available in sizes comparable to wood joists that range from 2x6s to 2x14s. Openings are provided in the webs for utilities such as electrical wiring and plumbing. The main components of metal framed floor units are the joists, rim track, cross bridging, and blocking. A metal framed first floor unit resting on a full basement or crawl space foundation walls is secured to the foundation with anchor bolts. One part of the clip angle is secured to the foundation wall using an anchor bolt, and the other part is secured to the rim track with screws. Bearing stiffeners tie together the ends of the joists and the rim track. Where intermediate support is required, the joists are lapped and tied together over a beam or load bearing wall. The overlap joists are fastened using bearing stiffeners and metal screws. For spans over 12 feet, solid blocking or cross bridging is required at the centers of the spans to prevent joists from twisting. Clip angles are used to fasten the blocking to the joists. Where cantilevered joists are required, blocking must be installed where the joists rest on the foundation wall. Blocking is installed every other joist. Web stiffeners connects the blocking to joists. Clip angles and anchor bolts are used to attach the rim track to the foundation. The cantilevered track is screwed to the top and bottom flanges of the joists. Similar to wood framed floor openings, Additional support must be provided around floor openings in metal framed buildings. The opening is framed with headers tied to trimmer joists. A trimmer joist consists of a C-shaped member inside a track member of equal size and these two members are tied together with number 8 screws 24 inches on center. Clip angles tie the headers to the floor joists. A plywood or OSB subfloor is installed after the floor frame is complete. Subfloor material and thickness is determined by the local building codes. If floor joists are spaced 24 inches on center, it is recommended to use tongue and groove sheathing for the subfloor. Ends of the sheathing panels are staggered, similar to subfloor panels for a wood framed building. Self drilling screws should be used to secure the subfloor as they will penetrate the panels without lifting them. Spacing between screws is commonly 6 inches on center along the edges and 12 inches on center at intermediate joists, unless otherwise specified by the manufacturer or local building codes. Proper screw spacing prevent floor squeaking as well as the use of adhesive or foam tape specified for wood to steel connections. Inline framing or stacking is used in metal framed buildings. Inline framing requires that all joists, studs, and roof rafters are in a direct line with one another. The reason for this is that unlike the double top plate for a wood framed building, the horizontal tracks that are the top plates for metal framed walls cannot adequately support the weight between the spans of the joists or studs. A maximum variance of 3 quarter inches on either side of the center line is allowed. Steel studs are vertical members that serve the same purpose as wood studs. The steel studs most often used have equivalent web dimension as 2x4s or 2x6s. Knockouts are provided in the webs for utilities such as electrical wiring and plumbing pipes. Studs should be oriented the same way to ensure utility cutouts align properly. The studs are placed at an angle between the track flanges, and then they are turned so they are perpendicular to the track. Track flanges may be bent slightly inward to ensure a tight fit between the track and studs. The web width of a track must be the same as the web width of the studs. Studs fit into the top and bottom tracks and are secured with one number 8 screw in each flange. Steel studs for load bearing, or commonly referred to as heavy gauge framing, range in thickness from 20 to 14 gauge. They are used to support heavier vertical loads and heavier thicknesses may be used in multi-story construction. Non-load bearing studs, also referred to as drywall studs, range in thickness from 25 to 20 gauge. Non-load bearing studs are only used for interior partitions and do not support loads other than the attached gypsum board or plaster finishes. Anchor bolts are commonly used to secure the bottom tracks of load bearing exterior walls to concrete slabs or foundations. Bottom tracks must be reinforced with a washer or a plate to ensure a proper connection. A first floor exterior wall placed over the floor joists and subfloor can be seen in this image. The main components are top and bottom tracks, 
diagonal tension straps, horizontal bracing, strap stud bracing, and corner posts. Note the inline framing of the studs directly above the joists. Diagonal braces, or tension straps, are used to brace studs against lateral movement. Exterior walls are sheathed with structural panels that are commonly OSB or plywood. The wall includes a window opening with a header, sill plate, and top and bottom window cripple studs. Diagonal braces or tension straps are used to brace studs against lateral movement. An outside corner post and stud to track connections are identified. Similar to wood frame construction, headers are installed above wall openings in exterior walls and interior load bearing walls. Headers are formed with two equal size C shape framing members or may be constructed with one or two angle pieces that fit over the top track. Box beam headers are commonly used if hold down straps are used to anchor trusses or rafters to the top of the wall. Box beam headers must be insulated before installing them. Back to back headers can be insulated after installation. An inside corner post is required for proper attachment of interior wall finish material. An interior corner post can be constructed in several ways. For the first method, where a non-load-bearing wall intersects with a load-bearing wall, a larger stud can be installed in the exterior wall and a smaller stud is fastened back to back with a larger stud. Another method, similar to constructing inside corners for wood frame buildings, involves fastening two equal size studs back to back. A third method involves the use of a slammer which is attached to the top and bottom tracks to provide a bearing surface for interior wall finish material. Blocking is installed between the studs on each side of the slammer stud for additional support. Where it is necessary to splice the tracks, insert a short piece of stud material and fasten it to the tracks where they butt together. Sealing joists are placed after the walls below have been plumbed, aligned, and braced. For a multi-story building, the ceiling joists also serve as floor joists. A continuous strap beneath the joist and solid bridging is fastened to the bottoms of the joists where the spans exceed 12 feet to provide rigidity. Ceiling joists must be placed directly above and in line with the studs below. When joists are lapped over an interior bearing wall, the first floor wall stud will be directly under one of the lapped ends. A bearing stiffener is used to secure the lapped ends in position. If continuous span joists supported by the load-bearing wall at the midpoint are used, the studs should be placed directly underneath. Where walls below run parallel with the ceiling joists, blocking is placed between the joists at a maximum of 48 inches on center. The heel or the lower end of a roof rafter rests on the track of a load-bearing wall below. Roof rafters are positioned next to ceiling joists and are securely fastened to the webs of the ceiling joists. The upper ends of the rafters are fastened to the ridge. For rafters covering long spans, rafter support braces extending from the ceiling joists to each of the rafters must be installed. Rafter support usually consists in 2x4 equivalents, C-shaped 20 gauge members that are fastened to each end with four number 10 screws. Lateral bracing will consolidate the rafters and rafter support bracing. Lateral support for rafter support bracing can be C-shape or track members. Lateral support for rafters can be flap straps, C-shape, or track. In seismic and hurricane areas, proper metal connectors must be used to fasten the rafters and trusses. This image shows two examples of this kind of metal connectors. Structural steel framing members consists of bolted and welded connections that form the framework of a structure. The framing components are manufactured to the specified size and they are painted with red oxide coating to resist corrosion. Depending on the size, the framing members can be put together on the ground and then lifted up with a crane or can be erected and joined together individually. Columns are fastened to the foundation using anchor bolts. Joints and assemblies are fastened using bolts and or welding. Structural steel framing members are commonly spaced 8 feet on center and heavy gauge steel framing members are used to fill up the spaces between the framing members and they are spaced 16 to 24 inches on center. Plywood and OSB panels are typically used as sheathing for metal framed walls and roofs. Panels combined with diagonal bracing produce a sheer wall. 
Print specification should include the thickness of the panels as well as the screws and or the pin sizes. A common example for sheathing is a 7 16 inch OSB panel fastened to the bugle head self-drilling screws. Winged drill point screws can also be used to attach sheathing to metal framing members. The rings create a pilot hole through the panel and it snaps when it engages with the metal framing member. Screws or drive pins must be at 3 8 of an inch distance from the edge and they are usually spaced 6 inches on the edge of the panel and 12 inches at the intermediate studs. Increased strength can be obtained when in addition to screws, special wood and metal adhesive is used before fastening the panels. Metal framed buildings can be finished with the same materials used for wood framed buildings. A weather barrier, such as a house wrap or asphalt saturated felt, is applied between the sheathing and finishing material. When masonry veneer is installed, the wall ties are fastened to the sheathing and metal studs and embedded in the mortar between bricks. Metal studs conduct thermal flow faster than wood. Therefore, adequate insulation takes on an added importance for metal framed structures. To prevent thermal bridging, exterior insulation and finish systems are commonly used on metal framed buildings. Thermal bridging takes place when structural members of a building, like metal studs and even wood studs, that have a greater thermal conductivity than the rest of the building, transfer the heat or the cold from the exterior of the building to the interior. Therefore, rigid foam insulation is recommended for steel framed buildings and for greater energy efficiency, it is not a bad idea to use it for wood frame structures as well. When installing rigid foam insulation panels, self-drilling screws with wide plastic washers can be used to prevent the screws from pulling through insulation. In addition, construction adhesive is also recommended. For metal studs, the insulation will have to be slightly wider than the insulation that is normally used for wood studs. Therefore, rated metal insulation needs to be wide enough to fill the C-shaped steel channel. If the insulation is not wide enough, in time it will sag and it will leave gaps on the upper side of the wall. Gypsum board is most often used for interior walls and ceiling surfaces. Typical fasteners are number 6 bungle head self-piercing screws. For securing a half inch gypsum board, one and an eighth inch screws are recommended, and for the five eighth inch gypsum board, a one and a quarter inch are the recommended screws. 